Good morning. Just a quick review here on where we are this year. We started out the year and we said that we have a new vision statement for the church, and our vision statement is to live as faithful followers of Jesus. That's what we want to do, live as faithful followers of Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're going to pray like Jesus, we're going to love like Jesus, and we're going to serve like Jesus. So we started four weeks ago talking about praying like Jesus, that we want to pray the way he prayed. And his disciples asked him, how shall we pray? How do you pray? We want to pray like you. And so he gave what we call the Lord's Prayer. I call it more of a model prayer, an example of how we should pray. And we've been studying that for the last uh, four weeks. This will be week number five. And so before we jump into that in a moment, let's go ahead and open in prayer. God, we just thank you for this time we have together this morning. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for the model prayer that you gave us. We thank you for Jesus who said, this then is how you should pray. And this morning, Lord, we just want to look at this one statement of leading us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Help us to understand that. Help us to grasp it. Help us to pray it in ways that is effective in our lives. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would, take out your outline out of your bulletin this morning. Uh, Someone asked me if I would need water because it's very long and two pages this morning. Don't get scared, all right? I promise I won't preach too long, maybe. But, you know, take that out, kind of follow along this morning. But if you look at the top of that outline, I've got listed there what our church fathers called the seven deadly sins. They're up on the screen, too, if you don't have that. The seven deadly sins. I want you to look at that list of sins. Now, this is not, this is not um, listed in the Bible. All right? you, you can't go and say, uh, Google, show me the seven deadly sins. Where do I find those in the Bible? And they're found in Matthew chapter 13 or something like that. Th- that's not going to happen. All right? This list is not in the Bible as this. But this is a pretty extensive list that the early church fathers thought were things that we struggle with. And I would have to agree that this list is pretty good. It it covers the areas that we tend to struggle with the most. And so I want you to look at that list, those seven sins listed there, and here's what I want you to do. It's not an exhaustive list, but I want you to look at those seven things, and I want you to ask this question, which two do I struggle with the most? Not Wes, but you. Which two do you struggle with the most? Okay, I want you to think about those two things that maybe you identify, this is an area that I usually fail in, this is an area that I usually fall in. I want you to then, I want you to circle them. All right, if you don't feel comfortable circling it, you know, just, just mentally make a note. These are the two that I struggle with. Mentally acknowledge these are my two areas of weakness. Now, here's what I want you to do as well. I want you to look at those seven And I want you to think about the one that you do not struggle in, that that you don't feel like you have much of a problem in. Because here's the thing we we need to do. We need to identify not only our weaknesses, but what are our strengths. So we're going to identify our strengths and our weaknesses, and maybe you put a check mark next to that one. For me, um, one that I don't really struggle with would be greed. Now, that's not always been the case. I'd, I'd say that's probably only been in the last seven, eight years. You know, that greed has not been that big in my life, that, that I'm not striving after possessions and wealth, that I've, I've come to discover that happiness is more important than gaining wealth. And so that's, that's not as big of an area for me nowadays. I also circled two of my weaknesses, which are none of your business. <laughs> All right. No, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll give you the two. Um, two of my big weaknesses are anger and gluttony. All right, anger, anger, you know, is an issue for me um, because I can be quick-tempered, uh, especially with family and when I'm driving. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> yeah, you don't. If you could record my conversations when I'm driving, it, it wouldn't be pretty. You would, you'd probably walk out right now if you could record them. Um, the other one, gluttony. Uh, I love to eat, and it's not bread for me. It's just food in general, and and if. If there's a food I like, I will eat it. I mean, if it tastes good, I will eat it until I am miserable for hours afterwards. I mean, that's, I have to control myself. All you can eat buffets, look out, because I will be miserable for hours after I eat at a buffet. I mean, I don't have any control. But here's the thing. Gluttony is not just limited to food and drink. 
Come this time of year, I can indulge in mountain biking. Come fall, I can indulge in hunting. And so gluttony can, you know, it can apply to different areas as well. It's not just food and drink. So now I'm asking you to participate, not out loud, but to think or to circle these things. And if you don't participate, then I'm going to get angry. All right? And I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, you, do, you don't have to circle them. Just identify them in your mind. Maybe for you it's pride. That was Satan's downfall. It, it could be greed. Um, you know, uh, you just, you don't have contentment. You're always wanting more. It could be envy. Envy is kind of a tandem temptation that goes along with greed because you see other people who have things that you don't have and, and you want those things and so you're envious of them and, and you want that. Anger, I've already said that's one of mine. I take comfort and Moses struggled with anger, but I also know that Moses was severely disciplined because of his anger. Uh, lust, one survey revealed that 97% of men said that they, they lust. The other 3% admitted they, they lie. All right, so <laughs> gluttony. Um, I've already touched on gluttony a little bit. You know, uh, maybe for you it's eating, maybe it's drinking, maybe it's um, hobbies, maybe it's shopping. So that can take different looks. Uh, maybe by tendency you're lazy. You're tempted to be complacent, to sleep in, to procrastinate. So laziness is one of those. But regardless of what area it is that you have identified in your life, here's the point I want to make this morning. All Christians, no matter who you are, all Christians are tempted to do wrong. I doubt that anyone can look at this list of seven things up here and go, oh, you know, there's, there's none of those I can identify with. I don't have a problem with any of us. Some of you look at them and go, I got a problem with all seven of them, you know? It's just, we all battle temptation. I battle temptation every day. You probably battle temptation every day as well. First Peter 2.11, Peter writes and he says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Now understand this, Peter is writing to Christians, okay? He's writing to Christians and he says this, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So what is Peter trying to say? Well, Peter's trying to say, you know what, the Christian life, you know what it is? It's a battlefield. It's a battle. It's a daily battle. And so in our series on praying like Jesus, we come to the section of the Lord's Prayer where it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, this is a very complex statement. And so we need to understand this statement because when we begin to pray this statement in an effective way, it really can lead to a victorious Christian life in our lives. And so let's break this apart and look at this first part. Lead us not into temptation. Now, here's what I want to do with this. I want to give you three things this does not mean. This does not mean. Obviously, it doesn't mean don't lead us any place where we're going to be tempted to do wrong. It doesn't mean that, because God sometimes leads us in places where we will face serious temptations. God led Moses to help the Hebrew people to lead them out of slavery in Egypt. But when Moses was following God's lead, that's when he was tempted to lose his temper. Jesus, right after his baptism, what does the Bible tell us? It says the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil to abuse his power. Jesus leads his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he'll be arrested. And he looks at his disciples and he says, now watch and pray so that you don't fall to temptation. Because he knew that he was going to be arrested in that very spot that night and his disciples might be tempted to pull a sword, they might be tempted to run, they might be tempted to deny him. And so he says, watch and pray so that you don't fall to temptation. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you follow God's lead in your life, listen, you will encounter temptation. He may lead you to church on Sunday morning, but you might be tempted to sleep. And that will make me angry. All right? <laughs> he leads you into some kind of ministry, but you're, you're tempted to be prideful. He, he leads most of us into marriage. And yet we're tempted to neglect our spouse or to quit. So God will lead us into places where temptation can easily surface. Now here's the thing. It's not wrong to be tempted. It's not wrong to be tempted. Temptation is a call to battle. 
What is wrong is when we give in to those temptations. The wrong comes from allowing our passions to rule us rather than obeying God's commandments. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are and yet was without sin. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're not saying, God, don't lead me anywhere where I'm going to be tempted to do wrong. You know, lead me only places where I'm going to have it easy. That's unrealistic. Here's the second thing it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, Father, don't entice me to sin. Don't entice me to sin. Because the Bible makes it very clear that God doesn't entice us to sin. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, When you are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. And so when you are tempted to road rage, don't say, God, why did you create so many crazy drivers? It's not God. You just have to grasp the fact that you live in Holmes County. <laughs> All right? it's, it's what it is. When you're tempted to look at someone else, Oh, why did you create her kids to be so beautiful and so talented and my kids are so average? It's not God, it's human nature. The Bible teaches us that there are three sources of temptation. There's the world, which is peer pressure. There is your flesh, your own sinful nature that drags you down. And then there is the devil, there's Satan, who uses his supernatural proudness to persuade you to sin so temptation never originates with god and so when we pray lead us into temptation listen we're not asking god to do anything that he wouldn't do anyway i mean he's he's he doesn't tempt us he doesn't tempt us here's the third thing this phrase does not mean it does not mean don't allow trials to come into my life don't lead me into any trials the word temptation in the original language can also be used in other places in the Bible to where it says trials or tests. It's, it's sometimes the same word. And so some commentators have suggested that this really means don't lead me into any place where my faith will be severely tested. Uh, they compare it to a, um, an athlete talking to the coach and saying, hey, coach, don't make us run wind sprints. Or a teacher or students telling a teacher, don't make the test too hard. And so some think that, you know, it means we're to pray, Father, take it easy on us, protect us from any painful experiences. But the Bible teaches that God occasionally does send difficult trials in our life to discipline us or to strengthen us or to enhance our witness. When I'm going through a painful trial in my life, I like to ask this question. Is it for my correction or is it for my perfection? In other words, I have to look at the trial I'm going through in my life, and I have to ask the question, did I do something to bring this on? I mean, is this a result of something I did? Is this a consequence for a sin in my life? If it's not for anything I can think of that I've done wrong, a consequence for the sins of my life, well, then I have to think that I'm going through this for perfection. Because here's the thing. Jesus went through trials. And he was perfect. And if Jesus, who was perfect, had to go through trials, then what makes me think I should be exempt? And so sometimes when you're going through those things, it's not for correction. It's just for your perfection so that you become more perfect like Jesus is perfect. Genesis 22.1 talks about Abraham and how Abraham was you know, tested. God tested his faith to see if he would sacrifice his, his only son. And it says that Abraham passed the test. He was willing to sacrifice his son because he believed that if he killed his son, God would raise him back from the dead and he would still have offspring through his son Isaac. He would give him many children. God sent a severe trial, a test, into Abraham's life and he passed. It would have been wrong for Abraham to pray, God, please don't let any trials come into my life because that trial proved his faith. James 1, 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so we shouldn't pray, don't lead me into any trials, because those trials might be the best thing for us. Theodore Roosevelt once said, 
don't pray for lighter burdens. Pray for stronger backs. And that's probably a good prayer. I understand, lead us not into temptation to mean this. Keep me from self-imposed and unnecessary temptation. Keep me from self-imposed, bringing it on myself, and unnecessary temptation. So keep me so close to living as a faithful follower of Jesus that we have this supernatural power over temptation. Think of it this way. Let's say you go to a conference in Columbus. So you're down in Columbus, Iowa, you're attending this conference, you run into an old high school buddy that you haven't seen in years. And you strike up a conversation, you're reminiscing, and all of a sudden he says, hey, why don't you just come over to my house tonight, meet my wife, you know, see my kids, and we'll just continue this conversation, we can have a good time tonight, just come on over. And you're like, well, that's great, why don't you give me directions to your house? He says, well, you know, it's kind of difficult to get to my house, kind of hard to explain, so why don't you just follow me? Now, if that were me, I'd be going, <laughs> look, buddy, I don't know Columbus. The traffic here is horrible, and so you are going to have to keep me in sight. I mean, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to try to wedge in between me and you, and I could lose sight of you, and so you're going to have to watch out for me and make sure that I am still following behind you. Now, you recognize that both of you have a responsibility. The one leading has to keep an eye on you, but the one following has to be faithful in following. So let's say I'm following this guy to his house, but all of a sudden I look over and I see Ohio Stadium. I'm like, oh, that's where the Buckeyes play, right? You know, I want to go. I've always wanted to see the shoes, so I'm going to drive, and I take the exit, and I go over to check out the stadium. But I'm thinking, well, you know, he'll wait. He'll wait on the side of the road until I come back on. You know, he's going to sit there and wait, or he'll come back and he'll try to follow me or try to find me. But I'm, what am I being? I'm being presumptuous. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting self-imposed disaster, and I could get lost. When we pray, don't lead me into temptation, it's acknowledging, listen, we are vulnerable and weak. We are dependent upon God every day in this world where things are trying to wedge in between us so that we lose our view of God. And if we lose that view of God, you know, we're going to be... We're going to be able to follow him, and then we're going to get lost. And so we're praying, don't invite self-imposed temptation. Don't invite, you know, unnecessary temptation into our lives. It's like the little boy who saved all winter to buy that baseball glove in the spring. And spring came along, and he was this close to having enough money to buy that baseball glove, and he prayed, God, please don't let the ice cream truck come down the road. There was a show on TV several years ago. I don't know if you watched it. I hope you didn't. Um, I didn't watch it, but it was the title caught my attention, and so I did some um, research on this show. The show was called Temptation Island, and it was a miniseries on Fox TV. And basically what they did is they took these four couples who were supposedly in committed relationships and they took them and they put them on this Caribbean island, secluded island, beautiful island. And then when they got there, the producer separated these couples into two groups, four women, four men. And then they plopped these groups into a group of 26 singles who had been chosen for their ability to tempt members of the opposite sex. Network executives insisted that this show was not about sex, but it was about researching the dynamics of successful, serious relationships. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, but you have to wonder, what kind of people would, would choose to go on that show, would agree to this arrangement? I mean, they're deliberately placing themselves in temptation to see whether their relationship, their character could withstand it. And I read about one offhanded comment that one of the women on the show made. Her name was Mandy. And on the fifth night of the show, the fifth day of being on this island, she's being carried on the shoulder of a man who is not her husband or the person she's in a relationship. And she looks back at the camera, and this is what she says. Tonight I will be in heaven. Tomorrow I'll be in hell. And I hope she's not. But if you deliberately put yourself in those places of temptation, you could be. You could be. 
You see, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're saying, Lord, don't let me get into a situation where I am likely to be unfaithful to you. Lord, don't let me get into unnecessary places that bring on self-imposed temptation on myself. In the prayer of the book of Jabez, or the book that I've been referring to, the, the prayer of Jabez that Bruce Wilkinson wrote, I've referred to it a couple times throughout this series. He writes this, Most of us face too many temptations and therefore sin too often because we don't ask God to lead us away from temptation. We make a huge spiritual leap forward. Therefore, when we begin to focus less on beating temptation and more on avoiding it, the most effective war against sin that we can wage is to pray that we will not have to fight unnecessary temptation and God offers us supernatural power to do just that. Lead us into not self-imposed or unnecessary temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So let's look at the second half of that. Lead us from, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Now here's the truth. There is a spiritual adversary out there. The evil one who seeks to deceive you, to entrap you, to enslave you. Jesus referred to him as a murderer, a liar, a thief. He says he's a thief that comes to kill, steal your relationship with Jesus Christ. Satan despises God so much that he wants to kill your relationship. He wants to steal your sense of purpose and joy and your assurance of salvation. He wants to destroy your witness to the outside world. Peter said this in 1 Peter 5.8. Again, remember, he's writing to Christians. Be alert self-controlled and alert, because your enemy, the devil, the evil one, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, what does a lion do when it's hungry? All right? They are vicious. They're merciless. They, they, they sneak up quietly on a herd, say of wildebeest. They look at that herd, they examine the herd, they try to pick out the vulnerable, the young, the weak, and then they begin to stalk them. And they try to get that one animal alone and isolated. And then they begin to chase. And they chase it so long till it wears out, and then they finally jump on it, they choke it to death, they, they smother it, and then the lion eats it. I mean, they're powerful. They're, they're dangerous. And Peter says, the evil one, your enemy, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He picks at us when we're most vulnerable. He came to Jesus in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting and said, aren't you hungry? Well, duh, right? He attacks when we're isolated from other Christians, when we're alone, when we can't call on reinforcements. Our enemy shows no mercy, and his intent is to kill, steal, and destroy for his selfish purposes. And when he's finished with you, he leaves your carcass for the vultures to pick over and to gloat. And so when we pray, deliver us from the evil one, we're saying, Father, I recognize I'm weak. I can't on my own defend myself against such a powerful adversary. I must depend on you every day against the attacks of the evil one who is he's lurking out there and he wants to attack us in psalm 50 verse 15 the psalmist says call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver you and you will honor me satan is the evil one and he works through evil ones he works through evil ones all right here's here's a misunderstanding that a lot of us have about satan Satan is not God. Satan is not omnipresent, meaning Satan is not everywhere. He can't be. He's not God. Satan is not all-powerful. He is not God. Satan is not all-knowing. He is not God. So a lot of us, we don't actually have to face Satan one-on-one. -on -one, but we have to face his spiritual adversaries. We have to face, face as spiritual beings that we wage war against. We have to face other people on this planet who are, who are Satan's, you know, people that he's warped from the truth to accomplish his wicked purposes. Second Thessalonians 3, 2 says this, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. So there are devious people out there who are agents of Satan who lure unsuspecting souls into hell. And you, they read you well, and they're fascinating, and, and they work to their selfish advantage. So for you young people, it may be another 
person at school who tries to entice you over and over again to join you for the par- to join them for the parties. It, it may be them, you know, other young people who are enticing you to bully other people at school. They don't deserve that. Why? Why pick on someone who's weaker and defenseless? Why? You know, they don't deserve that. It's not for your advantage. It's going to lead you into places you don't want to go. For college students, it might be that college professor who is trying to, you know, warp you with their intelligence. You know, they attack biblical truth. You know, they're devious. They're they're leading your your young minds astray. They're presenting a theory as a fact. And and they take joy and, and delight in making you begin to question your faith and destroy your faith. And why do they do it? They just do it for their own selfish purposes. For the reputation. It could be an attractive coworker. They're fun to be with. The personality is pleasing and the chemistry is there and they know you're married, but eh, doesn't matter. They exploit you just to boost their ego. It reminds me of the old country preacher who said this if you don't intend on going in the house, stay off the front porch. And we need to pray daily. Deliver me from the evil one. Father, I want to follow you so close today that, that I would, I'm naive to the attractions that the evil one has thrown my way. Father, I want to stay so close in following you that I'm beyond reach of people who have capability of destroying me. In the Old Testament, we read about Joseph, and Joseph was tempted to adultery. Potiphar's wife, his master's wife, because he was a slave in Egypt and working for Potiphar, She tried daily to have relationships with him, and he kept refusing. And then one day, Potiphar's wife's husband was gone. Potiphar was gone, and and she's alone with Joseph, and she grabs him by the cloak and says, come lie with me. And what's he do? He runs, leaves his cloak in her hands. Now, Joseph was in his mid-20s. He was single. Potiphar's wife, you've got to imagine, she was probably a knockout. She was probably a good-looking woman. How did he overcome that temptation? Well, here's what he said. I can't do this thing that would make me sin against my God. You see, he was following God so closely that he couldn't even invite the invitations of the devil. He wouldn't allow him to wedge his way in between he and God. The Bible says in James 4, 8, Come near to me, come near to God, and he will come near to you. God is in the business of delivering people. Deliver us from the evil one. God delivered the Egyptian, the Israelite slaves out of, out of Egypt. He delivered Daniel from the lion's den. He delivered uh, Esther from the evil plot of Haman to destroy, exterminate the Jews. He delivered Judas, Jairus' daughter from death. He delivered Peter from drowning. He delivered Paul from, you know, being killed by his adversaries. He delivered Bartimaeus from blindness. God loves to deliver his people, and he loves it when we pray, deliver us from the evil one. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So let's look at three practical lessons real quick, I promise, real quick. And then we'll close out. Three practical lessons real quick from this portion of the Lord's Prayer. Number one, acknowledge your own powerlessness. Acknowledge your own powerlessness. Here's what I've observed. Most people underestimate their ability to cope with suffering, but they overestimate their ability to cope with temptation. In other words, we look at couples who are going through tough times. Maybe their child has cancer, or maybe they lose a young child, or or maybe a, a young um, person, you know, young couple, one of them loses their spouse at a young age. And we look at that and we go, man, I, I, could, I couldn't handle that. I mean, I, I don't think I could endure that. But yeah, you can. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you could endure that. But here's what we tend to do. We tend to overestimate our ability to cope with temptation. We say, oh, well, you know, you know I, I can go to that party without getting sucked in. I can go to that bar and it's not going to affect my character. Or I can go to that university and I'm not going to be influenced. I can go to that movie and it's not going to corrupt me. We overestimate our ability to cope with temptation. Jesus warned Simon Peter. He said, Satan wants to sift you like wheat and you are going to deny me. 
Peter said, oh, no, no, Jesus, I would never deny you. He was overconfident in his ability to, to overcome temptation. That night, when he's warming himself by the enemy's fire, the spotlight begins to come on him. All of a sudden, he stumbles. I don't even know the man. And he's sinned. He gave in to temptation. Why? Because he was overconfident. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. That area that you checked as a strength for me was, I told you, greed. Be careful in that area. Okay? Never let down your guard, even in your strengths. Gordon MacDonald said, An unguarded strength can become a double weakness. So acknowledge Satan is coming. I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. Here's the second, the second thing. Pray daily for deliverance from temptation. Pray daily. Pray it every day. Once we recognize our helplessness, we need to say, Lord, I'm going to begin the day praying to you. I don't know what this day is going to bring forth. I don't know what's going to happen today. I don't know what will take place, but reinforce me in temptation. And sometimes you can anticipate. Sometimes you know where you're going to be vulnerable maybe that day. And so you pray, Father, you know what? I'm going to be on a business trip tonight alone by myself in a hotel room. You know, they have those stations that I probably shouldn't watch. And so, Lord, help me in that temptation not to watch those stations, but to watch the ball game or to just go to sleep. Or, Father, you know what? I'm going to a high school reunion this weekend, and I'm going to be around some old buddies. You know what? And, and they tend to bring out old habits and old attitudes in me. And so, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Or, Father, I'm going to be visiting a wealthy friend, and every time I visit this wealthy friend, I have a tendency to, to be greedy and, and, and show envy for what they have. Help me to be content what I have. Pray every day, lead us not into temptation. Here's the third thing, third lesson. Do your part to avoid temptation. You see, you can often answer your own prayer just by staying off the front porch. In other words, if you've got a gambling problem, don't go to Vegas. You've got a problem with materialism, stay away from the mall and the new car dealerships. You've got a problem with overeating, don't go to the all-you-can-eat buffets. You got a problem with sexual appetites, don't be on the internet late at night by yourself or, you know, go into Temptation Island. The Bible encourages us to flee immorality, to flee idolatry, to, to, flee, to flee the evil desires of our youth. Don't try to stand on your own. Don't try to avoid temptation by yourself. You need to pray every day. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. James 1, 2. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of of life that God has promised to those who love him. You see, if we follow the Lord's commands, if you follow the Lord's lead, listen, you're not going to be exempt from temptation, but you will have the power to overcome those temptations. And then you'll be able to say with the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Our mission statement is to live as faithful followers of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said this, follow me, follow me, follow me. And when we follow him, he leads to life. Because here's what that scripture says. Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus leads to life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. Your word is good. God, you are good. We thank you for Jesus, and um, we thank you for those disciples who asked Jesus one day, teach us to pray like you. And then Jesus gave us this model prayer that we should follow. And we come to this line in there that says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
So right now as we pray, I just want all of you to just, in your minds, just think of those two areas that you may have circled, you may have thought of earlier. I want you to concentrate on those two areas for just a moment here. I'm praying and asking God to help you in those areas. To not invite self-imposed and unnecessary temptation into your life in those areas. now I want you to focus on that that strength you had. This is an area that I I don't stumble in often. I don't seem to have a problem with pray about that area because that could be the next area of attack. So just take a moment and pray about that area. I want you to think about your triggers because we all have triggers that in those areas we struggle with that that set off these thoughts, that set the sin into motion, that that create these temptations for us. I want you to think about those triggers and it may be a place that you go that automatically it begins to create this temptation. It could be someone that you're around and when you're around that person the temptations begin to to surface. It it could be uh, just a something you watch on TV. I want you to think about those areas, those triggers that cause you to be tempted to stumble and and just begin to pray about how you can avoid those and, and asking God to give you the strength to avoid those places, those shows, those people that cause temptation in your life. Father, we come to you and we just thank you for, uh, we thank you for your power. We thank you for the spirit, the spirit that you've given us that lives inside of each of us that is there. We know when we're heading into temptation. We know when we're about to sin. We have that spirit that's telling us this is wrong, this is wrong. Father, help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see. That we follow your leading. Help us to follow so close to Jesus that this world that Satan can't wedge his way in, that we keep our eyes on you, we keep our sight on you, and we follow you. And when we do that, we can overcome temptation. Yeah, we're going to be tempted, but we can overcome that temptation. Father, thank you for that gift of the Spirit, of your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.